Okay, so maps in R. So the good news, like I said, okay, so making a map in R is really similar to what we've already done. Um, and this is primarily because of a package called SF, which I spoke a bit about yesterday. Um, so it stands for simple features. I'm not entirely sure why, why it's called that. There must be some technical reason behind it. But the reason why SF is very good, it, it's, re it's a relatively new package, or it's become popular relatively recently. Um, and the reason why it's good is because it's, it's uh, compatible with ggplot. So as, as we've discussed, like the data, hand the, the, the data handling side of stuff will be different because you're dealing with geographic data. But when you get to the visualization side of things, um, the structure of the code required to make a map is almost identical to like, for example, making a bar plot or making a scatter plot is very, very similar. Um, it's worth mentioning at this point. So SF is what we covered today because SF is at least it's my my interpretation of what's going on is that SF is like the future of a ge geography mapping and GIS in R. Um, but there is another package called SP. I'm not actually sure what SP stands for, uh, but SP is older and it's, it's been around for many many years in R. And that's how mapping, that's sort of how spatial mapping related stuff began in R. Um, and it, it's just worth remembering, like some examples you see might use a, a SP related data rather than SF. It's very similar to the data frame and Tibble distinction that we discussed before. They basically do the same things. It's just a different way of storing data and a different way of handling data. Um, but it's not too much, it's not, again, it's not a big deal because you can convert between the two very easily. It's just worth remembering, okay, we're gonna focus on SF today, but be aware that some examples you come across online or you know colleagues or whatever might use SP and you can just be like, okay, yeah, it's SP. Um, and probably what you wanna do is just convert it to SF instantly uh, if you wanna use the skills we do today. But yeah, SF is definitely the way forward. If you, like that I have a book within reach. Uh, any like modern book that comes out like this book, which I think is maybe a year or two old now, uh, that will focus on SF. Like it will mention SP and it will use SP in the book, but books like this will, will definitely have a focus on SF because SF is, you know, it, it's where things are going in the R world. Um, yeah, so. I'm very pleased SF exists because it's made my life a lot easier. But there is bad news as well. So if I know that there are there are some people here that are are you know they they are geographers. They're more even more have a stronger and longer geography background than me. Um, but if you are completely unfamiliar with geography and you haven't used a GIS before, then of course a lot of this uh, territory will be completely new for you. Um, so the good news is that the visual side of it is easier, but it does mean that you do have to learn a few more skills that are very sort of geography specific and specific to the field, the field of GIS, so geographic information systems, which are basically just software to conduct geographic spatial handling and, and analysis. People might have heard of stuff like QGIS or or ArcGIS is quite a popular one. These are just pieces of, you know, they are software specifically designed to handle spatial data, um, but you can basically use R as a GIS, um, but GIS is, is the field in, in its entirety. Okay, so I, I, to, to me, my, my, in, in my mind, the three things that you should focus on if you're completely unfamiliar with GIS related stuff is firstly, just be aware that spatial data is slightly different and I'm going to cover this in a minute. Spatial data is slightly different. Um, a key extension of spatial data is the idea of projections, which some people might actually be familiar with, like anecdotally a bit, because it's basically how we how we portray a, a more or less spherical Earth on a flat surface. Um, and also, there are some additional visualization is issues that you might need to consider. Um, but I will cover these briefly now. But as always with these things, like it's a bit of a crash course. And if you really want to get into mapping in R, 
um, and you're completely unfamiliar with GIS, and I do recommend you read, you know, like books like this or, or GIS related books that give you a more general introduction to it. Um, yeah, so spatial data. Um, so we're obviously, we're typically used to, when we think of data, typically as a social scientist, you basically think of what we've been referring to as data frames or tibbles. Like you think of rows and columns in a, in a, in a spreadsheet or in a SPSS or whatever that might be. But spatial data is slightly different. So there are two main different types of spatial data. So one of them is called vector data and one of them is called raster data. So we are going to focus on vector data today purely because um, that overwhelmingly is the most popular data type in social science type research. Um, like I said, I don't have a, a long formal geography background, but my understanding is raster data tends not to be used in social science research. Uh, raster data tends to be used in uh, like uh, like geology type stuff and uh, what would you call it? Like physical geography, basically. Physical geography, raster data is very, very popular. Social science, human geography is less popular. So you can ignore raster data for now. Vector data, uh, you can just think of it basically, spatial data is a representation of the real world. So when you look at a map, um, it's basically just trying to represent the physical features on the ground in an intuitive and accurate way, in a way that you can manipulate and, and visualize and use in a, in a GIS piece of software. And it does this by basically representing features on the ground using either points, lines or polygons. So points, we kind of already covered a little bit already because we were talking about crime locations. Points are basically just comprised of an X and a Y coordinate. So in order to locate a specific area, a specific point in space, so for example, where a specific crime is committed, you need an X coordinate and a Y coordinate to join them up and pinpoint them on the Earth's surface. Lines are basically just an extension of that. So you have a series of points and then you, you connect up these points in a particular order in order, to, in order to create the line. So here, like that example there is just four different points um, within the data, it tells you what the coordinates are, and then it tells you um, what order they should be connected in. And the lines, and when the lines, the final one, when the lines are um, basically come back on each other and form, form a closed uh, circle or, or shape, then it's a polygon. So intuitively you might think, okay, points will probably be used to represent things like crime locations, or maybe um, I don't know, if you're mapping out like where post boxes are or something like that, you would probably collect that data and visualize that data using point vector data. Lines might be used for things like rivers or roads or something like that. Um, and polygons might be used for stuff like buildings. Sometimes there's a bit of ambiguity around it. So for example, a road is actually, it's a lot more than just uh, a single line connected by points. You could represent a road using a polygon, for example, because of course roads have particular widths. Not all roads are the same shapes. They might be like bulged out at certain places. Um, but broadly speaking, uh, you, will, you will intuitively know intuitively have an idea about how you want to represent your data. It's, and it's just worth thinking about. You might not even be creating your own data. You might not collect your own data. You might just download it from websites like the UK Data Service. And you, you can just think, it's just useful to be aware of the fact that, for example, if you download um, like census uh, block boundaries, like we were talking about LSOAs yesterday, like neighborhood units, when you download uh, neighborhood boundary data from the UK data service, it will be vector data and it will be comprised of polygons because neighborhoods are, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a boundary line that's closed at the end in order to form a shape, like a broadly sort of rectangular or circular type shape. Um, but we deal with both polygons and points today. Uh, so hopefully that will give you a reasonable spread of what we're going to talk about. So to give you a kind of like less abstract example of this, um, I'll just check the chat in case people have. Okay, hopefully Julia can help you out with the with the Dropbox folder. Mm. So yes, so as an example of it, so here we have this is a satellite image of the LA Dodgers Stadium, 
Um, and okay, this is actually uh, not reality because this in itself is a, is a satellite image. So this is also a representation of reality. But if we just pretend that this image is, we're looking at it from a helicopter and we're actually viewing what's happening in real life. You can see that, of course, a hell of a lot is going on in this image. In, in real life, th this area is comprised of a huge amount of information. So, of course, we have the stadium in the middle. We have the car parks all around it. There's loads and loads of roads uh, intertwining, different types of roads. So, like minor roads, you have motorways. There's probably a few footpaths going through the forested area. And you have tons and tons of different buildings, all of different shapes and sizes. Basically, there's a hell of a lot of information going on. So when it comes to spatial data, the idea is, OK, we want to uh, we want to create a representation of this, uh, this real life area in a way that's sort of intuitive and useful and can actually be read and manipulated using uh, R or GIS or whatever it might be. Um, so I use this example here because I recently I did a project with a colleague recently where we were interested in the relationship between crowding and crime. So basically we pulled information about um, attendance at Major League Baseball games, which is why it's LA Dodgers, attendance at Major League Baseball games and basically looked at the relationship between how many people attend each game and how much crime occurred on that day. So that's a relatively straightforward research question. And we were interested in the built environment. So for example, like how many buildings surrounded the stadium, um, the, 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 the intuition being that if it's a very densely built up area, then uh, people will be, uh, you know, sort of forced into, into smaller spaces and crowds will be compressed slightly and it will become more crowded and there might be more crime. That was kind of like the hypothesis around it. So of course, it, you know, realistically, we could pull every single bit of geographic data around the, the LA Dodgers stadium and use that in the analysis. But in reality, that would be far too complicated uh, and completely unnecessary. So we just want to simplify it as much as possible. So what we ended up doing, and this is, this is a visual that's been created in R using SF and ggplot, is basically we've only pulled the, uh, the building footprints of the sort of a mile or two around the stadium. And we got that from the OpenStreetMap uh, API, which you, I, in that tutorial, I sent a link yesterday. You can work out, you, you can figure out how to do that. But basically what we've got here, if you just focus on the, on the, on the black shapes to, to begin with, this is vector polygon data, and it's just representing the building footprints around the LA Dodger Stadium. So it's highly, highly simplified. It's a highly, highly simplified version of this previous one. But basically, it's, it's enough information to answer the research question that we were interested in. We could have pulled lines that represent the roads surrounding the stadium. Uh, we could have pulled additional polygon data that represented uh, green spaces around the stadium, or maybe even point data that represented individual trees or, some, or lampposts or something like that but we decided just to go with this. So in this example here, the black stuff that you're, you're, you're viewing at, that is polygon vector data. And each one of those buildings is basically just a representation of a building using a series of points. Um, and within the data, we know the order that those points should be joined up in and those points all come round and they close together to form a closed, uh, closed shape, which we call a polygon. And also you can see the little red dots and the red dots are the crime location. So they are um, points vector data because we got that from open police recorded crime data in the United States. And they give you a latitude and longitude coordinate which together pinpoint uh, a, a point location and you can then plot, plot it on top of the map. Um, yeah, so in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this data, we basically had entirely comprised of vector data um, and it's comprised of point vector data and polygon vector data. Um, yeah, so hopefully that clarifies. We're just representing real life in a highly simplified way using vector data. I will just check the chat again in case people have, does anyone have questions on that normally? Um, not normally, does anyone have questions on that in general? I'd also no, be very interested to hear from geographers um, about their usage of vector data, or perhaps there are geographers here that have used raster data for social science research. 
Um, yeah. I would say I, um, but maybe back to the point about uh, whether you use points, lines, or polygons. I mm. mapped the tram network in Manchester, mm. and the stations I had as polygons, okay. and the tr the lines. The so the tram lines were were line vectors, um, yeah. because although there is a physical width of the line, it didn't make any sense. It's not an accessible width of the line. People yeah. taking the tram can't choose to move, you know, right or left along that tram line. Yeah. So just, yeah, it's a bit about the, the sort of logic of whether, what kind of shapes you want to use to represent something. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a really good, good example where, you know, maybe maybe the tram line data does exist in polygon form, but even if it does, you might think, oh, okay, it doesn't actually need to be in polygon form because, of course, the tram width is probably this identical across the whole network um, for the purpose of, of a visualization or, you know, if you're calculating tram time, tram, ta <laughs> tram travel times, you don't need it to be polygon. So, you know, in fact, it might be, it might uh, not be possible to calculate travel times if it is a polygon. Um, yeah, that's a really good example. So like to give you an example of the, the, the paper that I sent people yesterday, which was a practical example of using OpenStreetMap in R. Um, I think I, I mentioned it, we pulled um, the locations of London Underground stations from OpenStreetMap and we created a buffer around the stations and then counted the number of crimes occurring in that buffer. So I suspect that OpenStreetMap does have polygon data on London Underground stations and that polygon will probably just be the main station building. It won't be anything underground, but it like um, just the main station building that you'd view on ground when you wanted to get on the tube. But for the purposes of this, of that, of the research, we didn't need to have the polygon version of the underground station because we knew we were going to have to do a, a buffer around the station. Uh, so we we only used the point location. We only used a specific x y coordinate to locate the station, uh, even though, of course, the station is much more than just an x y coordinate. It's it's an entire building. But for our research question, to keep things simple and keep it intuitive, we just used the point. Um, so sometimes you have the option of that, sometimes you have the option. Um, it's just, yeah, depends. sometimes you're limited by the data available and sometimes uh, you actually have a choice and you might decide to use one or the other. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just Sam, can I just build on that a couple of yeah, points? Yeah. So the trams are a really good example because actually there's directionality to it. So mm. you've, on the bus is the same, you've got two sides to the to the tram and one going one direction and one going the other so that can actually be relevant yeah um the stadiums is a good example because the buildings could have it if, if it's that big you might want to look at what's happening within different parts of the stadium so it can yeah. actually have polygons within so you could break it up into into a set of polygons yeah and the third one that's confusing is sometimes people aggregate crime data to grids to squares yeah. so in effect you can use some of the raster techniques because you're using grids on so you're aggregating point data to a raster in effect yeah. that's kind of the blur between them but yeah it depends on what you want to do in terms of yeah. thinking spatially about it yeah that's that's a really good point so yeah for people who aren't aware like like raster data you can but basically it, it's a a, a a very fine um fine grained grid over an entire area um that's why it's often it's often used to like measure cloud cover or something like that or pollution because these things cover entire areas and you might be able to measure or estimate like a pollution level for every meter squared of an entire country for example um which is why it's often not used in social science research because we're often not using data at, at that level but like andy said some re crime research what what people do is they create an artificial grid so for example it could be like 100 by 100 meter squares um probably as polygons probably as polygons but the, the, these areas cover an, an entire array like an, an entire city this huge grid of 100 by 100 meters uh, squares and then you aggregate those points into the squares um, so that, that, that brings up another good point of firstly, 
sometimes if you use stuff like grid uh, grid analysis stuff in criminology it might kind of have similarities with raster data even though i suspect that most of the grid analysis people do is using uh, the it might be a grid of squares but it will probably be vector data i imagine um what was the other point i was going to say uh, oh yeah and and secondly of course you know vector data spatial data doesn't necessarily have to represent something that's even real like okay so here we're, the crime locations are real in a sense because a crime occurred at that particular location or roughly that location and of course the buildings physically exist but you can also create vector data of something that's completely synthetic like a 100 by 100 meter grid does not exist in reality but it's quite useful for the purposes of the, of the research and a 100 by 100 meter grid might make sense like theoretically or just empirically for your research. Um, so usually vector data is a representation of real life, but it can just be completely artificial as well if, if it's useful in that way. I mean, neighborhood boundaries kind of don't really ex exist in a formal sense on the ground. Like people have their own idea about what a neighborhood is, but it's useful for the purposes of research to draw boundaries for LSOAs to create a neighborhood. Um, but on the ground, these boundaries might not exist, or it might just be a road in reality, but it's like a representation of something to make it useful. So the other bad news, and I think this is the final bit of bad news, is that um, on top of getting used to the whole idea of vector data, although to be honest, like I think it, hopefully it's relatively intuitive and you don't need to understand it in a highly technical way. It's just knowing that it's a thing. Um, spatial data is kept in different formats. Um, so today we will focus on a format called a shapefile, um, which I think is probably a little bit dated. I think a lot of people who work in GIS use uh, other, other formats of keeping spatial data like GeoJSON or KML. These are other formats of spatial data, but shapefiles are extremely popular. And when you download data from practically any government website, whether it's uh, UK or America, whatever it might be, you will get the option of a shapefile. So I think it's a useful one to know about. And yeah, there are very popular formats to store geospatial vector data. So it's just useful to know about it. Um, when you download shape, uh, shapefile data, it's just useful to know that it basically you, you usually you download it as a zip a zip file, a zip folder, um, and that folder will contain a number of different components. So one of them will actually be having a file extension of .shp, which is the spatial data itself, like the lines or the or the points or the polygons, but it will also contain some other files that sort of um, provide additional information. So you might have one called, well, you probably will have one called .dbf, and that's basically the data underlying the spatial information. So let's say you go on the UK data service website and you download a shapefile of LSOAs in Manchester, which is what you're gonna use in the example. Um, you'll, get the, you'll, get a zip, you'll get a zip file, you'll get, and in that zip file, there'll be a .shp file, which will be the actual boundaries of the LSOAs but there'll be a .dbf, which will contain the data associated with each LSOA. So if, you, if, if, there's, if in that data it included like the uh, number of people living in each LSOA or the deprivation in each LSOA, that's what's contained in the DBF. And the DBF links to the actual spatial data. So you have each polygon representing the neighborhood will have data underlying it from the DBF to tell you something about that particular attribute. Um, and it's quite useful to know that DBFs can be opened on their own. So I'm pretty sure if you click and drag a DBF into Excel, it will just open as a normal data frame with rows and columns. And you can also load DBFs into R. There's a function called read.dbf from a package called foreign. Um, and that will just load in whatever the DBF is as a data frame, as you're familiar with and as you're used to. And it will just ignore all the spatial components. So that's quite useful to know as well. Um, what else do I say? Yeah, different types of different types of spatial data, and you know, again, I'd be interested to hear from the geographers here about whether they still use shape files. Sorry, but there is a debate over, you know, what data formats are actually quite useful. 
you know, people here have said, oh, if you're using raster data, then use GeoTIFF, whatever that is. I've never used it. Vector data, there we go. Every shape file, that's what we're using. But CSV, apparently, you can keep vector data. I didn't even know that. Uh, 3D data, a whole different ballpark. I've never used 3D spatial data, but that will, of course, require um, different data format as well. I think, to, to, in my mind, if you're a social scientist and you want to create some maps to supplement your analysis or explore some data, I think you'll probably get by pretty well with, with, with shape files. So I wouldn't overthink it too much. Projections are pro probably the most complicated thing I've come across in, in, in GIS related stuff. But again, it's something where you can, con in, in my mind, and I know some geographers will disagree with me, but in my mind, you, you can conduct perfectly accurate, uh, like good quality research and analysis with a very minimal understanding of projections, um, which hopefully we will cover today in sufficient detail. But if people haven't, if people haven't come across projections before, it's basically the idea of, and, and people know this intuitively, of course, the Earth is, uh, I think it's an oblique spheroid shape, like it's more or less spherical, right? But of course, when we look at a map on a wall that's been printed off, or we look at a map on a computer screen, that map has been created and it's undergone some kind of transformation from the Earth shape, which is spherical, and it's basically had to be flattened out onto um, a piece of paper or a screen in order for it to be, uh, in order for us to look at it and manipulate it in the GIS software. And that transformation is known as a projection. The projection itself is obviously, it's a highly technical process and probably highly mathematical to make that projection. Of course, we do not, not, not have to have that technical understanding of it because software like R or QGIS, they, they, they do the projections for you. But it is very important when you download data or collect data yourself that you think about what projection you are using. So it's commonly referred to as a coordinate reference system. That's how we refer to it in R. So one that you will have come across before, which is known as a geographic coordinate reference system, like the, its sort of code name is w, WGF84. Uh, I'm not actually sure where this link takes you, but w WGF84 is basically latitude and longitude coordinates. And it's, ve it's a very popular way of um, identifying uh, where things are on the Earth's surface. And often when you download data, it will be in latitude, longitude formats. And when you load it into R, the important step that I will show you later on is you just need to tell R what CRF it's in. So if you've downloaded data and it's latitude longitude coordinates and it's WGF84, you just need to tell R, like basically warn it in advance that the data you're giving it is WGF84. But there are other, uh, other types of CRFs which are, uh, yeah, so they're more useful and, and, and more commonly used in, in research are projected CRFs. Um, and project, there are many, many, I think there are probably hundreds or maybe thousands of projected CRFs. Um, and that's basically because the projected CRFs that you use, the, uh, which, which one you use might depend on what you're doing. Because that transformation process that we spoke about is, is imperfect. That there's always going to be a flaw in making that transformation from something that's more or less spherical to something that's flat. Um, and different projected CRFs are good at different things. Some of them are particularly good at navigating, for example. Some of them are better at representing the shape of something. Some of them are better at measuring distance. So there are multiple different uh, projected CRFs, even for the same geographic area. Like the United States probably has dozens of different uh, types of projected CRFs, and they're probably good and bad at different things. For the purposes of what we're doing, the one that you must know about is the British National Grid, which is basically the, I would just describe it crudely as like the standard projected CRS for the United Kingdom. So as an example, we'll go through later. If you download data, um, okay, if you download data from the UK data service, I'm pretty sure 
that it will always be projected in the British national grid. I'm pretty sure it will be because that's the standard and that's probably the one, if almost certainly the one that you should be using for your, for your maps and for your spatial analysis. But in some cases, and, it's, and luckily we do get this example here, you'll download data for the United Kingdom and it will be in latitude and longitude coordinates. It will be in WGF84. And if you download data and it's in latitude and longitude coordinates, the first thing you do is tell R that it's WGF84. But the second thing you almost certainly want to do is project it to the British National Grid. Because when you do things like measure distance or calculate area, it, it's going to be uh, more suitable. It's going to be more accurate and more suitable for what you're doing. Because the British National Grid is like tailored for the United Kingdom. Hopefully that'll make a little bit more sense when we do it in R. The main takeaway message, I think, is that basically be aware of the CRS that you're working in. Be aware of the CRS when you download data, take note of what the CRS is of the data you've downloaded. And then when you're, whenever you're conducting or if you're, whenever you're measuring distances or measuring areas or sometimes visualizing stuff, make sure that you're using an appropriate CRS, which fortunately, if you're doing research in the UK, you can just stick with the British National Grid. And I will show you more of that later. If you want to read more about projections, there's loads of stuff in the Q QGIS documentation. Um, and it goes into loads of detail about how projections are actually done, uh, the various different accuracies. So here you go, like map projections are never absolutely accurate representations of the spherical Earth. They're always distorted. I actually have a link up here uh, hopefully you can still see this. This is a little sort of app website and it basically just demonstrates the idea of the distortion. So if I go on, so Makata here is a very popular way of, it's very popular projection for the whole world, basically. You'll see it like people recognize that shape instantly because it's, it's, the, it's the projection that's often used on like school maps and textbooks and posters and things like that. So what you're looking at the, at the right is the Mercator map, and on the left is actually what's happening in reality on the Earth. So what I know this in advance, I'm sort of cheating a little bit, is that the Mercator projection doesn't distort things that much around the equator, just for the way that the projection is made, the way that the transformation is weighed around the equator, the distortion is fairly minimal. So if I move this up and down, uh, sorry, side to side around the equator, you can see that that square on the left of the actual Earth is like, it is distorted, but it's not too bad if I move it west to east around there. But if I move it north to south, you can see that it begins to heavily distort. If I go towards Greenland, which is a very common example used of this distortion, you can see that it begins to squeeze things around the poles. And the same thing will happen if I go to Antarctica down there, it will squeeze things. And that's just, it's just, and it's different for different types of projection. So here's a cylindrical projection. You can see at the equator, it's actually like, it's actually like pulling things apart. So Africa is like stretched uh, more, more so than it was with the Mercator. Um, and it's a different type of distortion at the poles. And every single time there you do, you make a projection, you make that transformation, this process is happening. Um, and it's different for different, you know, different projections distort things differently. Uh, and that's why you should uh, think about what projection is most suitable for what you're doing. But I will stop talking about it now because I'm also not an expert on it either. I'm not an expert on, project on projections, but I'm, I'm still absolutely convinced that you, you, you can, yeah, you can, you can use the right projection and you can conduct good, good analysis and uh, appropriate analysis and appropriate visualizations by just understanding the idea, like the kind of abstract idea of what a CRS is and just make, make sure you're using the right one and transforming the right one. I will stop talking about that now. Uh, the um, other bad news <laughs> is, uh, is visualization, visualization issues. So there are challenges when it comes to making a bar chart or whatever it might be. Um, but when you begin to make maps, you uh, other other issues come up. So there's a, I linked to a blog here by a guy called Joe Radcliffe, who uh, he, he is a criminologist, but he does like spatial related stuff quite a lot and policing and things like that. And he wrote this sort of uh, 
quite amusing blog about basically like very sarcastically saying what you should and shouldn't do when you're making a map. Um, things like a scale bar, for example, are things that you obviously wouldn't really consider when you're making a bar chart, uh, but they can be very important when it comes to making a map. Um, I hope this link is, no, it's gone. Okay, <laughs> I, I will fix that link. I mean, if you Google Jerry Radcliffe map blog, it will almost certainly come up because I think it's quite popular. It was on the UCL website, apparently. Um, but I think it's on his personal website as well. Um, Sam, I think he had to take the sarcastic one down because people in America took it literally. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he okay. works in America and he's had to redo it to a non-sarcastic one, unfortunately. Yeah, fair enough. I, I do remember realising that there was both a sarcastic one and, an, and a deadly serious one. So maybe he took, yeah, maybe he took the sarcastic one down. Um, yeah, but it's, it's worth a read. And, and of course, if you look at generic GIS books, uh, they will also give you a good idea about what you what you shouldn't shouldn't do when it comes to mapping. Um, another thing, and this this issue you might be familiar with because it's becoming in, increasingly sort of controversial when it comes to mapping political results. Um, like there was a quite a famous tweet about the United States election because um, when you look at a map of the United, if you looked at the latest um election result in the united states on a map by uh by county i guess of what they have um it kind of looks instantly like the republicans won a landslide victory um but th this is the, but it, it's very misleading because of course very densely populated areas are often uh, vote democrat so when you look at a map of the United States, there'll be this sea of a particular color, uh, particular color representing the Republican Party, and it will look like it's just dominated the whole of the United States because of the massive varying difference in the size of different counties and different states. Um, so it can be quite misleading. This is a paper, again, I'm talking about myself again. This is a paper that I did with uh, Rika from the University of Manchester, where we basically investigated the same issue, but for the Brexit referendum result. Um, because if you look at the Brexit referendum result on the left, so this is the proportion of uh, people in each electoral area that voted Remain. If you look at the image on the left, you might think if you weren't really familiar with, the, with, with, with this is just England, I think, isn't it? Yeah, just England. You might think, okay, um, or barely anyone voted Remain uh, because it's just absolutely dominated by blue and green which are uh, you know, the, the lower percentages of, of Remain voting. But of course, very densely populated areas, so urban areas tended to vote Remain. So that map in itself is at best not particularly useful. And at worst, it's actually potentially very misleading when people want to draw a conclusion from, a, from, from, from the map about the election result. So we looked at various different ways of basically manipulating these boundaries to better betray the underlying data. It's kind of like what I was saying yesterday, like data visualization is, is an act of communication and you wanna try and convey the underlying data in a way that is understandable and accurate. Um, and this, this is kind of a counterintuitive, no, not counterintuitive, sort of ironic situation where actually mapping out the raw data can actually be quite misleading. So uh, maps have, have, have this challenge and we use various different, different methods. So cartogram, cartogram, cart, cartograms you might have come across before because they expand and contract uh, polygons according to a particular variable. Um, hexagrams, which are basically like a completely bespoke method and that map performs the best. We did a survey about how people, under, how people understood the maps and the hexagram performed the best. That was basically uh, practically invented by uh, Richard Harris at the University of Bristol and uh, some of his colleagues, I think. And then we also look at square grids and hexagonal grids, where basically each each that and the hexagram each grid uh, is still a is still a local authority or whatever it is, but they're all regular shaped, so your eye isn't drawn to particular areas on the map. Um, and yeah, we cover in the extras material. If you go on the worksheets and you click on extras, I cover the code required to transform this map here of Manchester into um, the regular grid that you see on the right. Um, and as I go, as I say in that exercise, um, 
these are not not always the best thing to use. You can be misleading by using a regular grid. It can, you can mislead people more than using the raw boundaries. It very much depends on uh, you know the variation in size of the polygons you're using. But it's still quite a useful technique to be aware of. Okay, I said I wasn't gonna talk and then I just end up talking for like 35 minutes. But hopefully that's given you like a little crash course in mapping in general, uh, GIS and specifically in R. Um, I am probably not going to talk too much more. Has anyone got any questions, first of all? Whether it's GIS related stuff or about SF or R. I'll give it a minute in case people think of something. I just want to say I posted a couple of links in the chat um, mm. to some uh, research done on maps and how different maps can show you different things and mm. change the appearance. And also one that uncovered like geological features of a region based on voting patterns. It was uh, mm. quite a popular oh. Twitter thread last um, November, I believe. Cool. Yeah, that sounds good. I haven't seen them. Excellent. Mapping, I was quite pleased to see it. There was actually a whole segment on the BBC. Uh, I can't remember when, whenever the last election was, and they specifically spoke about the issue of, of uh, well, basically this issue, um, which was great. I was Because I think the BBC ended up using a kind of hexagram type map to, to report on the election results for that specific reason. And they gave a bit of justification to it, which I thought was good. So it's like becoming a common common thing to understand, I think. I think, yeah, you're right. It, it's definitely a laudable change that people are expecting to have to justify their choices. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I saw, um, it, it, even though it's becoming popular, I think some people still fall into the trap of doing it. I saw a paper... In the, in the Lancet, which I, the Lancet is quite highly regarded, I think. And it was about how mobility has changed during the pandemic. And they used a map that was almost identical to this one on the left, but it was actually much smaller than that as well. There were like six maps, all like this. Um, and it, you just could not tell what was going on. Like the map might as well have not been there because it, everything was like, London was almost invisible. So it, obviously most people know roughly where London is, but if you weren't that familiar with it, you just wouldn't be drawing any, either any conclusions from the map, or you might draw completely the wrong conclusion from, from it. So it's quite, yeah, it's definitely worth thinking about. Um, and yeah, the hexagon things look quite cool as well, to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, I think they look better than uh, squares. Yeah, yeah. And in, in this example here, um, the square and the hexagonal grid, like people, people basically drew more or less inaccurate conclusions from the map by looking at the square grid and the hexagonal grid, um, which is quite interesting. You, know, you really can mislead people by using these techniques, but they can be quite they can be quite useful. Um, yeah, okay. I think that's basically it. What I might with the breaks at eleven, isn't it? Yeah, we're we've got a bit of time. Um, yeah. So w what I might do is just very briefly go through the first few lines of this exercise, because hopefully that will at least clarify the idea of coordinates and the idea of the CRF. Uh, not that one, sorry, the, the, map, the maps one, which I know some people might have started already, uh, but I'll just go through it very quickly. So the data for this exercise is uh, burglary records which you will have on the Dropbox, hopefully. And I'll, again, I'll open up an Excel just so, um, just so everyone's seen it. So I, ha I think I did clean this a little bit, but you can basically see, actually, I'll just load it into R because then people are familiar with this. So again, I will, these skills are things that we covered a little bit yesterday, but yeah, so I load read R because that's how I load in data. Um, and I'll load the SF package, which is the, the spatial related stuff. So I will create an object just called burglary underscore DF again. Sam, can you move yeah. your screen onto our studio, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you're still sharing the web. Uh, 
Yeah, you basically have to stop sharing and share again. Has that changed it? It does seem to have, yes. Okay, cool. So yeah, keep tell me if it, if it changes. So I've, I've loaded in radar, I've loaded in FF, I'm creating an object called burglary underscore DF, uh, and then I'm, I'm going to load in uh, this burglary records CSV. So this CSV that I've given you, which I will show you once I've loaded it in, it's basically the same as what you get when you download open police recorded crime data in England and Wales from that website that we covered yesterday. So I've loaded it in, I just click on it to take a look at it. And you can see we've got a crime ID for an individual crime. So each row is, an, is, is a specific crime. We've got the month that the crime occurred. We've got the LSOA that the crime occurred in. But remember, this is individual crime records. So the LSO, LSOAs are repeated. The LSOAs are repeated because some crimes occur in the same LSOA. It's got the outcome of the crime. So investigation complete, no suspects identified. It has the longitude and latitude coordinates. So, and it, so, and it has the local authority. So basically, when I keep banging on about the CRS, if you download data like this, you take a look at it and you see, okay, they've given me the latitude, the, the latitude and longitude coordinates. So all you should be thinking is, when I load this into R, I need to tell R that it's in that WGF84 um, coordinate reference system. That's basically what you should be thinking. For example, it, you might intuitively, based on my probably not very good explanation, you might think, oh, okay, this data is from the United Kingdom and it's been released by British police forces and therefore it will be British National Grid. And you might load in this data and you might say, okay, latitude, longitude are the coordinates and it's projected in the British National Grid. If you do that, it will be wrong. Like the, 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 the points will be completely inaccurate. You'll probably be able to tell because it will look ridiculous. It won't look like what you expect to look like. But the point is the points won't be representing reality in any way whatsoever. So it's very important that you get that step right. And I frequently get that step wrong uh, purely by just like not thinking or maybe misunderstanding the data. But I usually, I think, uh, realize that I've done it wrong because I always conduct like some checks afterwards to make sure that it's projected in the right way. Like I might overlay a, a satellite images of the area just to make sure that like actually things overlap in a way that's, that's correct and that it has the right projection. So I now have six minutes, but I'll just show you the first line of code that you will do. And this is, if you go, that I do cover this in the example, but basically if you have a data frame that's not spatial at all, like this, we have a data frame, it contains coordinates, but it's, R doesn't know it's spatial. The first thing you'll wanna do is convert it from a typical data frame or tibble into um, a spatial FF object. So you, I'm going to create an object now called burglary underscore FF. So subtly different, but different. And there's a function called ST as FF. So you say it says convert foreign object to an FF object. And the contents of this function will be not, will, will probably be a data frame. And you just have to specify the things in that data frame that are spatial. So the first argument we can put is, okay, I think it's X. Like I said yesterday, if I do question mark ST as FF, it tells you like the contents of what I need to put in. So X is the object so you can convert it to an FF. So X equals burglary underscore DF. And then the, I think, yeah, the second bit of information I need to put in is the coordinate. So in case of, it says here, my, screen is in the way, but it says, in case of point data, names or numbers of the numeric columns holding the coordinates. So you could say chords equals, and then you do use the little C when you're gonna say like a list of something, and you say X equals, and in this case, it's, you got, you, got, you got to get the name right. So it's like latitude and longitude with capital letters. So X equals longitude because longitude is like the equivalent of the x-axis. That's something I have to Google almost constantly is which way around longitude and latitude are. But um, I don't think I'm alone in that actually with some, some people. Maybe it's just me. Uh, yeah, so you, you, you say, okay, this is the data frame that contains spatial information. Then you state with the coordinates, the chords, 
argument, you say these are the columns that contain the coordinates that I want you to convert to point spatial data. And then the final one you need to do, which is the, which is the really important one, is you say what the CRF is. So that you say CRF equals, and what you put in the, what you well the options that you put here are I don't I don't sure what the technical name for them is, but basically each projected CRF has a has a, has a unique identifier number um, in order to I think, I think it's EPSG or something like that. EPSG. Uh, is it EPSG? Yeah. EPFG geodata parameter data. And it's basically, you can just consider it to be like a library of uh, various different um, coordinate reference systems. And each one of them has this unique ID. And when you want to refer to that CRF in R, you just need to know what, the, what that I ID is. So here we want the ID for WGF84 because it's latitude and longitude coordinates. And we need to tell R that we're dealing with coordinate data that, that has the coordinate reference system WGF84. Now, because I do this constantly, I've remembered that the CRS number for WGF84 is, I think it's 4326. It took me months to remember this. I'm probably gonna get it wrong now, but I think it's 4326. We can actually check, because if I do WG, if I Google EPFG WGF84, And go on spatialreference.org. So it just gives you a, a summary of what this quarter reference system is. And you can see at the top it has 4326. And the British National Grid, which is a projected CRF, has its own code as well that we'll deal with in a minute. But for now, you want to make sure that you're telling R that you're dealing with uh, WGF84 WGF with the CRS 4326. So now when I run that, it creates a new object, Burglary SF. And importantly, what you'll notice is it's absolutely identical to, in terms of um, the, the content, if I click on it, it still has all the same information. It has the month, the LSOA code, the crime type, the outcome, but instead of having the latitude longitude coordinates, it's basically converted them into a new column called geometry, which is it's, it's completely identical. Like it's, it's just the latitude and longitude coordinates from the original data frame but now R knows that it's spatial and it knows to treat those coordinates with the WGF84 CRF. And the final step I will now do is hopefully to encourage you, I will show you how straightforward it, straightforward it is to then plot these points on a map because I can just use the same structure of code as we did before. So ggplot burglary equals SF. And just with the way I happen to write um, ggplot code is I'll then, I just specify the data and then I do the plus sign and then I add a geometry, but rather than, um, rather than like points or bars or whatever it might be, the geometry for plotting maps is geom underscore FF because it's a simple features object. I'll make sure I have FF installed. I write geom underscore FF. So all I've done is specify the data and I say that the geometry is SF. Couldn't find function ggplot, okay. <laughs> I haven't loaded the ggplot package, so I will do that now. ggplot2, then I will run it and then it will, fingers crossed, work. <laughs> there we go. Ooh. So on the right hand side, you should see all these points and you know, just as an intuitive check, although I probably would do, do further checks, at least I know that that is basically the shape of Manchester. And if I'd specified the CRS of the British National Grid, which is 27700, it would, it would, look, it would be completely wrong. I'm tempted Let's see what to that it. looks like. Yeah, we can, let's have a look. So I'm gonna change the CRS to 27700, which is basically, li I'm lying to R and I'm telling R that even though it's language, latitude and longitude, that actually I'm telling it it's British National Grid. So I run that again and then I will try doing it. Yeah. And it looks completely bizarre, like it's squished. And you might intuitively be like, okay, I know this is wrong. It, it, it's so wrong that for some reason, ggplot hasn't even managed to plot, plot an X and a Y axis. I'm not sure why that is. It's probably because these coordinates don't even exist in, <laughs> yeah. 
and you can tell it's wrong. And if, for example, in QGIS or in R, I overlaid a satellite image on top of this, it probably wouldn't have any information or I'd be in the middle of the sea or something. Very frequently I do this and I'm like in the middle of the sea and then I know that it's wrong. Um, so yeah. always a sensible check. Am I yeah. in the sea? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 